This is the story of Michael, how COVID threw a grenade into his already fragile life. As the pandemic spread, Michael's much loved mother suffered a serious mental breakdown. Completely paranoid about becoming infected, obsessive about keeping her home clean, Michael was the casualty. She chucked me out of the house, and that day I cried my eyes out because I've never seen my mum like that. I slept on benches, slept on buses when it was cold. Sometimes I even slept in a train station just to get a better shower. What's it like sleeping rough when you're 17? It's not the best thing in the world. You're paranoid, you're always looking around, you never feel safe. Michael was right to feel unsafe. Offered somewhere to stay by a family he vaguely knew, he now faced a very different danger. They wanted me to sell drugs. They wanted me to go somewhere called country. If I didn't do what they say, they would beat me up. If I didn't do what they would say, they'd say, I'm going to stab you, I'm going to show you the knife, I'm going to stab you with. Michael ran away and was found sleeping on a park bench by someone he went to college with. The friend took Michael back to his house to see if his mum could help. It was about 10, 11 o'clock at night. Um, he broke down. He was hungry. Bit by bit, he told me, um, basically, that he was on the run from a gang. I was in bits. Um, I had to literally all sell him to, once I'd sell him to bed, I just cried. And what did that mean to you, to have somewhere to sleep? That meant a lot, but it got to a point where I didn't feel comfortable because I was trespassing in someone's, in someone's house. I was bringing my burden on them when they got their own problem. So Michael left and ended up sleeping rough again. Simone desperately trying to get the local authority to help him. It's like I had a choice of either keep him as my own child, um, which I couldn't financially do. I have my own children. And the other option was to let him go and sleep on the streets. So you realise you have this 18-year-old, really, really difficult home situation, being exploited by gangs. Who did you go to for help? At the first people we contacted was Wolven Forest Emergency Services. They're obviously during the pandemic, they've been given the budget and everything else to be able to make sure everyone gets off the streets no matter what. So in my head I was like, well, they've got to help, they've got to help him. The person that answered the phone, she honestly said, I'm just answering the phone, um, I can't help you, you'll have to call back tomorrow. You might as well have left an answering machine. What is the point in paying someone to answer the phone to say they don't know? Simone says they were asked for a string of documents a homeless Michael simply didn't have. And the fact he'd just turned 18 created even more difficulties. At one point we were sent to the children's department. And obviously, and the thing is, when I spoke to someone there, they were devastated when I told them what was happening. And they wished you could hear they wanted to help. But it was like, I can't because it's 18. That 18, once you hit 18, there is no help. There's no help. You're an adult, you're a fully grown adult, go and live your life and sort your own problems out. And you're making it quite clear he's not just homeless, but he is facing real danger. Yes, I'm literally, those are the words I've been using in the emails. Um, but yeah, they knew and basically it was just the same thing every time. He, he's, got, he's got a home to send him back to the house, send him back to his mum. Simone says Waltham Forest said Michael was not their responsibility as he and his mother had previously been moved to temporary accommodation in a different borough. But when they phoned that borough, they sent them back to Waltham Forest. Daniel is an outreach worker with the homeless charity Thames Reach. He says during that period, he often came across Michael walking the streets in the middle of the night. He too tried to find him somewhere to stay. Everybody who can let him down has. Do you know what I mean? Everybody has let him down. The fact he doesn't seem to have been seen as an emergency, I mean, are you surprised by that? Yes, I was very surprised at that, I was. Because he's, he's been a victim of violence, extreme violence, and we had to fight to the death with the caseworkers just to, just to illustrate that point, and they weren't having any of it. How common do you think an experience like this might be? Very. In terms of homelessness for young men, very. Especially during COVID-19, we've seen young men kicked out on their 18th birthday, we've seen everything, so... As awful as Michael's story is, it's, um, he's definitely not alone in his misery. There's loads. Crucially, police had accepted Michael as a potential victim of violent exploitation through the government's own national referral mechanism, or NRM. 
it should lead to specialist help for people like Michael. But as we've reported, it's either barely understood or ignored by many authorities. And that's exactly what Simone found. When we sent these details to the housing, um, Wolven Forest Housing, they had no idea what an NRM is. And I had to explain on the phone to the officer what an NRM was. It should be recognised, surely, straight away. But no, not at all. And it should trigger help, not least with housing. Yeah, yeah, it should trigger something. It didn't seem to trigger anything. I told them my life is in danger, I need help, I need help. Kept saying it. I called out, out of our team, I called, called a lot of people, no one helped me. What does that feel like? Heartbreaking. It makes you feel like you're not important, it makes you feel like you're nobody. Many local people did step up to help. Nathan Brown was one of them. Michael volunteers at a sports camp he runs. Nathan says Michael's story shows how easy it is for gangs to exploit young people. But the systems have felt, they've, 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 they've quite clearly felt it. And where would he be, do you think? That's, that's a question we all like to know. He would be on the streets. Where, I, where he would be now, I don't know. He could be anywhere. And from what's happened with the gangs and how things are happening these ways, he's a vulnerable person, easily to be picked up, looking for someone to help. And to be honest with you, it seems like a gang would probably give him more help at the minute than, than the authorities are. He's looked at someone that's, again, bringing him in and he's seen it as a home. It's not actually, but it's a facade. But as far as he's concerned, that's someone that's willing to look after him. There's probably hundreds of Michaels out there right now that don't have me, don't have a Simone, don't have anybody, and they're going to get lost. After weeks of almost daily calls to councils and charities, Simone wrote to the local MP, making clear her desperation. Soon after, Michael was offered a place at a hostel. I'll probably still be, in, I'll probably still be on the streets. I'll probably be dead by now. But it took someone out of the community to help me. In the statement, Waltham Forest Council said while they couldn't comment on an individual case in detail, they did, after necessary checks, provide an individual with accommodation. They added, the council's main priority is always protecting our most vulnerable residents. Over the duration of the COVID-19 pandemic, we have provided accommodation to 59 rough sleepers. It's easy to see, but what has this done to you? Oh. <laughs> um. I'm stressed, emotional, um, I'm on beta blockers um, because I have panic attacks now. Everyone that's met him and I've introduced him to has said to me he's an amazing boy, he really is and so well mannered, so he's thoughtful, he's, he's a grafter, he really is a grafter. For Michael, things are still not easy. He wants to go back to college, find some work, but most of all, he needs a permanent home. But after everything, he is determined to never give up. Earlier, I spoke to the Children's Commissioner for England, Anne Longfield, and I began by asking her what she made of what had happened to Michael. Well, it's a heartbreaking story and it's one that shows again that during such a period of intense kind of pressure, pressure on, on, on families, pressure on services, there are some really vulnerable kids here that have just fallen through those gaps. And clearly there's a young man who has done so. But to see and hear the story of someone who is so vulnerable, so young and so kind of rudderless without help, uh, sleeping rough, and without those uh, for the best of intentions who can care for him, uh, then it really you know, demands that we get much better at ensuring those kids don't uh, fall by the wayside. Clearly, the fact of him becoming homeless was absolutely disastrous for him in terms of making him more vulnerable. Do you have any sympathy for the local authorities, for the charities who would say, there isn't enough accommodation, we did what we could, we did it as soon as we could? Well, I do understand there's a practicality of there not being enough residential accommodation for young people who are homeless. And I will often 
um, appeal to local authorities where young people have moved and there's a dispute about who might be responsible for that to work together. Um, but having said that, at the end of the day, we've got a really vulnerable young person here. There are those that have responsibilities to protect that young person. At the end of the day, there will be vulnerable young people throughout the country who've fallen through the net. And my worry is that they end up in terribly vulnerable situations, much so more so because of the pandemic, without anyone feeling it's their responsibility to protect them. And that's something that clearly I feel uh, needs to be changed. And what was quite clear from his story is that he was vulnerable to exploitation. He was a victim of exploitation. He got that rather ugly phrase, the National Referral Mechanism, an NRM, which should trigger help, but it didn't. There's an issue there, isn't there? There is. Um, I mean, those that are looking to exploit young people will find the most vulnerable. They will um, track them down. They will often offer them support in the first instance. And then it turns nasty very quickly. And the threats to those um, individuals and their family are very, very real and very, very serious. The uh, mechanism that he was, you know, could have been supported under the national referral mechanism is there for children who are, have been identified as being exploited and trafficked. But it is quite clunky. Um, it doesn't always mean that services are working together at all. And when you see kids that do fall through the gap, actually, it's because services don't join up. They don't pass on that information. They don't collaborate. I mean, it would be a comfort to all of us to think that Michael's story is a one-off, but the youth worker in the film says there are many Michaels, and that's true, isn't it? It is true that there are many Michaels, and uh, that is a huge concern and worry. And my concern, clearly, they were vulnerable before the COVID crisis, and they're more vulnerable now. Look, I would like local authorities to be, you know, harnessing the power of youth workers to get out there and find those kids and work with them, and to also then work with other agencies to provide that support. Um, that isn't happening to the extent it needs to. And as schools go back in September, there's an awful young people that need bringing back and engaging, and they're really offering high levels of support to get over what for some will have been an immensely traumatic experience. Anne Longfield, thank you very much for talking to us today.